Good day. This is the second part of the discussions about how to compute goodwill or gain an acquisition if with non-controlling interest. So make sure to watch the first part or part one so that this session would be easier for you. So as a review, we said that there is a non-controlling interest if the parent or acquirer acquires only less than 100% of the shares or shareholdings of the acquiree or subsidiary. So that was already tackled a lot of times in our respective discussions for this course, accounting of or for business combinations. So normally in our previous discussions, we did not discuss about items with or involving NCI in computing goodwill or gain on acquisition. So for now, let's incorporate NCI once again, and then this time it will be with certain cases involved. So allow me to show to you an Excel file for examples. So make sure also to familiarize with the rules as to how do we compute the goodwill or gain on acquisition. Anyhow, we will be discussing them as we go along the way or recalling the rules as we go further. So we have here the formula. So remember to make use of this formula to compute goodwill or gain on acquisition. That would be price paid. Then we add the NCI to get the total value for the subsidiary, for example, as acquired or the acquiry as acquired. And then we can analyze this as price paid as that percentage that is controlled by the acquirer. So this is the controlling interest while the NCI is that percentage not acquired. Needless to say, if the company that is the acquirer acquires 100% of the shares of the acquiree or subsidiary, so there is no non-controlling interest. So meaning all is controlling interest or 100% has been controlled of the subsidiary. So many things can be said about the same thing. All right, so total company value of the subsidiary or acquiree less the fair value of identifiable net assets equals goodwill or gain on acquisition. Goodwill if positive result while gain on acquisition if negative. So we have here the details of our examples from the previous problem. So again, the company pays for cash, 800,000, or this can also be a non-cash consideration. For example, when we issue, let's say, shares or bonds to acquire the interest in the subsidiary or the shares. And then we can also for example, issue non-cash assets, if not shares or bonds. And then this also includes, for example, contingent consideration payable, just in case that there is anything, for example, if there are certain performance measures obtained, so the probable value shall be incorporated as part of the consideration. So just to summarize that this is the price paid though at 800,000. Then what is acquired is actually 80%. So that is shown here on the subsequent examples. Anyhow, if ever we're just go, I mean, given the 20% NCI, so this means that the controlling interest then is 80%, even if, again, it's not clearly stated in the problem. So that is a matter of 100% minus 20%. Then also given is the fair value of identifiable net assets of subsidiary. That is, again, the difference between the fair value of assets, identifiable by the way, such that if there is existing goodwill, we are going to exclude that or we have to exclude that. Then less liabilities assumed. Now, the next item that we should know or remember is the minimum non-controlling interest or NCI value. So remember under IFRS 3, there are two options again. Number one is with a usage of NCI at fair value, in its absence, we have to estimate the fair value. And then we also call this the estimation as 
people good will approach her method. And then we have to make sure though that the given and the estimated NCI values are at least equal to the minimum NCI. Coincidentally, this minimum NCI is the option two, which is the fair value of the proportionate share of identifiable net assets of subsidiary, which is basically just the fair value of identifiable net assets multiplied by the NCI percentage. So this is shown here as E6, which is this one, multiplied by E4, the NCI percentage. So we get 124. Thousand. Going back to method two or approach two, which is proportionate share of the fair value of identifiable net asset of subsidiary, this is the minimum, which is also known as the partial goodwill method or approach. And then we can also say that at the end of the day, this is always like the minimum value, whatever approach or method that we use. All right, so for case one, that was already discussed in part one in which that was really straightforward with a given NCI at fair value and because that exceeds 124,000, so that's why we easily computed the goodwill at a certain amount of value. Next, for case two, the NCI at fair value is not given. So as said, if it's not given, then we are going to approximate or estimate the fair value under IFRS 13 fair value measurement. So that's level two, similar prices in similar markets. So how do we compute? Knowing that 800,000 has been the price paid to acquire 80%, so we can compute the 100%. So 800,000 divided by 80%, we get 1 million pesos, which is the total company value. Then if we multiply this by 20%, the NCI, so we get now the estimated fair value at 200,000. So that's how we got 1 million total less the fair value of identifiable net assets of subsidiary, and we get the goodwill gain on acquisition. All right. Then case three, what if it's 140,000? Take note, by the way, that the minimum is 124,000. So that's why for case two, Whatever was the estimated amount, 200,000, we used it because we really have to satisfy this one. So there are very few situations that the NCI estimated or even given is lower than the minimum. So we have to take note of that as well. So for case three, 140,000 given, that's higher than 124,000. Therefore, we have to use it. So that's why this is. A total of 940,000 less the same amount equals 320,000. Next, for case four, what if the NCI at fair value is 120,000? We do not use this one because this is below the minimum. So we have to make use of the minimum 124,000 so that the goodwill is 304,000. Next, what if, if for case five, we are going to base it on proportionate share of fair value of identifiable net assets of subsidiary? By the way, this is on the premise or assumption that this is the requirement in the problem. Because if it is not stated in the problem as to the proportionate share, which is option two, we really have to make use of the estimated value if the NCI at fair value is not given. And also, we will make use of this one if, despite usage of the estimated NCI at fair value, still we did not satisfy the minimum. So for this one, the same as case four. For case six, this is full goodwill approach or method. This is the same as estimated NCI at fair value. So that's why it's same as case two. And for case seven, partial goodwill approach or method, this is same as case four, in which we utilized the proportionate share of identifiable net assets of subsidiaries. So in fact, cases four, and five are the same as here. So let me replace this with case five then. Okay, because you might be thinking that case four really is the same as case seven at all times. No, it's case five that is the same as case seven. All right, so hopefully you got the points well for the discussions 
here for how to compute goodwill or gain on acquisition, then hopefully this will be helpful to you. Thank you and God bless to everyone. Thank you for listening. See you in the next session.